Hi, I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Business Review, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to, welcome you to the season's first episode of HBR Now. Our special guest today will be uh, journalist and author Walter Isaacson, and we'll be bringing him in in just a moment. Um, as many of you know, we originally launched this show back in April during lockdown. We called it HBR Quarantine, and we wanted to create a platform to connect with HBR's many readers who suddenly found themselves working from home. Our goal was to bring in an A-list of guests to talk about the big issues of the moment, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, dislocations to the economy, and how all of these are affecting business and career paths. The response from all of you was overwhelming. We took a break for the summer, now we're back. And when I say we, I mean uh, as well my co-host from last season, Josh Macht, who heads product and innovation for HBR. And I'm thrilled to introduce our new co-host, Octavia Gordima. Octavia is a longtime career coach and the founder of the 2010 agency. She's now working on a book that's a career guide for underrepresented women. We also have a new sponsor for the season. So in fact, let's hear now from our friends at Accenture. Change is all around us. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. And one more little visual before I bring in our co-hosts and our guests. We have a tradition of unearthing odd little TikTok videos that capture the moment we're living through. So uh, roll it, Engineer Dave. I'd like to return this. Oh, okay. Uh, was there a problem? A little bit too much fires, UFOs, and police brutality. Did you unplug it and plug it back in? I did. And then a global pandemic and murder hornets appeared. Do you want to exchange that for 2021? No, not a problem. <laughs> Definitely defective. <laughs> Right. So let me bring in Josh and Octavia. First of all, uh, welcome, Josh, to season two. They said it was a pretend TV show. Well, now it's a pretend TV show with multiple seasons. And a uh -huh. Amazing. And I'm no longer at my house. This is our uh, HBR Now studios at uh, Boston in Brighton. That's a big change. Yep. And a special welcome to Octavia for joining us as co-host this season. Welcome, Octavia. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so Octavia, maybe you could talk a little bit about yourself or, for, for people who are just getting to know you. Yeah, so I'm in Los Angeles and I'm a career coach, the founder of 2010 Agency. I coach professionals across the country and I'm also writing a book, um, a career guide for underrepresented women. So really thrilled to join you guys and be a part of this show. So um, Octavia, we're happy to have you here and I'm curious who... Um, because we were so lucky to get you to agree to join us on this show. Who would be your absolute dream guest, not, not including Walter? Yeah, not including Walter. Well, in addition to Walter, okay. my dream guest would be Roz Brewer, um, the chief operating officer at Starbucks. Her resume is just formidable. In oh, addition wow. to her role at Starbucks, she's on the board at Amazon. She was the president and CEO at Sam's Club. There'd be so much to talk about. All right. Well, put out the big ask. <laughs> yeah. So, so just to get us into the conversation. So, picking up on the TikTok video. I mean, this this is a year like none other. I, you know, years from now we will remember where we were in 2020, the combina combination of pandemic, recession, a very consequential U.S. election is almost more than any of us can can bear. The election is foremost in my mind right now. You know, the one four years ago laid bare how conventional understanding of the electric of the how bad conventional understanding of the electorate was and how inadequate our forecasting tools were I think we had figured that we'd be better equipped this time around with better data and better sources and then COVID 19 hit so we really don't know what's happening how many people will vote how will they vote how will the ballots be counted what external forces will disrupt the campaign will anyone even trust the result it's interesting to me to see political analysts with polling data in hand that seems to indicate clearly what will happen on November 3rd, but no one dares trust it after what happened in 2016 and with all the disruption since then. Josh, what's your what's your take on the moment? I mean, I find it on the election side, this is just, it's got to be one of the most extraordinary moments ever. I find the backdrop of what we're living through and the whole the whole idea, I think everyone's so tense with the election and then the winter coming and this notion of like really going into the tough, into the teeth of, especially in the Northeast where we are, 
uh, this this idea that you know it feels like we're heading into this very tumultuous time. On the other hand, there's sort of a lot of reasons to sort of think next year we could even start to see some progress and reasons to be optimistic. Um, and so I try not to lose sight of that on on the other side as well. How about you, Octavia? Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think front of mind really for me is the impact on our next generation in terms of education and also the educators. You know, I'm in awe of what my kids' teachers and the 3.2 million public teachers across America are doing day in, day out. You know, right now my kids are in class on Zoom because in our school district, our schools are still closed and we're just having to take it day by day and just figure out what comes next. And I know as a parent, I'm not used to not having the answers in terms of how this is gonna be. And so there's just some really profound and important questions that are happening right now on the ground, as well as we look to our decision makers in terms of what's to come with the election. All right, all good. If you just if you just tuned in, this is HBR Now. It's time to bring in our guest. Uh, Walter Isaacson has led an amazing career with many interesting chapters. He spent 25 years at Time Magazine and served as its top editor from 1996 to 2001. He then served as CEO of CNN and as CEO of the Aspen Institute. And he's probably best known as the author of many best-selling books that chronicle the lives of some of the world's most innovative minds. Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Leonardo da Vinci, and more. These days, he's also a professor at Tulane University in his hometown of New Orleans. Walter, welcome to HBR Now. Hey, thank you. It's good to see you again, Adi. Yeah, yeah, it's also possible he was formerly my boss. Uh, <laughs> so Nobody's ever right been in. Walter, I'd love to start with the U.S. election. We're two, way, two weeks away from what really seems like the most consequential election in memory. But I want to ask, is it? I mean, you know, as a chronicler of history and of great individuals and someone who sat atop Time magazine for years as it tried to take the pulse of the nation, what's your take? Is this more consequential than others or do we just say that every four years? No, this is more consequential than others. This is a major divide in our society. And not since 1968 have we had such you know, polarizing forces in our society. And in this case, we have a president who is actually putting uh, fuel to the flame of the divisiveness and polarization. So I think it's a, an election about whether the country is going to be able to get unified again or whether we keep this uh, path of divisiveness, whatever you may think of the ideologies of either party. Uh, this one has deep consequences and an administration that has really torn down some of the norms and structures we have in our society. Um, for those who are just joining us, this is HBR Quarantine. If you have questions for Walter Isaacson, please put them in the comments box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. I mean, Walter, as you think back, are there any parallels in history, though, where things seem to be really kind of out of whack, and yet they sort of came back to a, a, a norm that the, the, the center reemerged, the center held. Yeah, I think America is that way. I can uh, quote uh, Albert Einstein, one of my biography subjects, when he comes to America, he finds uh, after the World War II, the rise of Joe McCarthyism and uh, that sort of uh, very bitter attacks on people like J. Robert Oppenheimer, who worked with Einstein on the atomic bomb pro project, questioning their loyalty. And Einstein writes to his son, Hans Albert, I've seen this before. I've seen this movie before. I've seen it where the uh, Nazis took over and then when the communists took over. And then two years, three years later, after Eisenhower gets elected, a great president who calmed the nation down, Eisenhower and the mainstream press like uh, Edward R. Murrow and the army uh, hearings bring Joe McCarthy down and Einstein says, it's amazing America's democracy. It seems to have an inner gyroscope because when you think it's gonna tip over, it knows how to right itself. Do you have any reason to doubt that America still has that gyroscope? I think we still have the gyroscope. Uh, I mean, we're gonna see a lot uh, in this election because uh, part of the gyroscope is the institutional norms and the checks and balances, and those have been under assault. And this is not just an American thing. There's been a populist and authoritarian populist backlash 
uh, around the world that I think people like us, and by people like us, I mean people who read the Harvard Business Review, should make some pains to understand, because a lot of the conventional wisdom that we supported ended up being wrong, where people were left behind by globalization. People were messed up by everything from free trade to technology to immigration. That backlash and that tribalism and nationalism, you can see it from Turkey to Hungary, even to the Brexit election, and certainly to Trump. So I think it's not just a U.S. question of whether we bounce back, but whether the idea of market-based liberal constitutional democracies can survive. So let's turn, I, I have a feeling my co-hosts are going to want to talk to you more later about the election, but I, I want to talk about innovation because that's really at the heart of a lot of the, the books that you've written. And, you know, the, the list of people you've written about are, are varied. Einstein, Steve Jobs, Benjamin Franklin, Da Vinci, Kissinger. They're all very different, but I'm sure you've thought about, you know, what maybe are common characteristics that elevate talented, hardworking people to this higher level of really of game changing achievement. Can you can you talk about some of those? When I started to uh, discuss with Steve Jobs writing his book, I said, why do you want me? And he said, because everybody you've written about has stood at the intersection of the arts and the sciences. They're interested in everything from the humanities to engineering. And by seeing things across nature, he said, I mean, all of nature's wonders, you can see the patterns of nature. And so it did occur to me, because you remember, I'm sure you've been or seen some of them, whenever Steve Jobs launched a product, he did with that slide on the screen of the intersection between the liberal arts and uh, technology. He said, if you stand at that intersection, that's where creativity happened. And I realized that was true of Benjamin Franklin, who was everything from a writer and an artist and a musician to a scientist. And we sometimes think of him as a doddering dude flying a kite in the rain. But those electricity experiments were the most important scientific experiments of the time. Same with Einstein. When he's stumped on general relativity, he pulls out his violin and plays Mozart. And the culmination of that is Leonardo da Vinci, who is both a great artist, but also an anatomist and a zoologist, and loves to know, as Benjamin Franklin, Steve Jobs, and Einstein did, everything you could possibly know about every subject knowable. So I, I'm going to tout uh, an HBR product. We're publishing a book next month called Invent and Wander, which is sure. the collected writings of Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. Um, Walter has written a really fine uh, introduction, original introduction to that book. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about, about Bezos? I mean, he seems to yeah. be the most successful People, business person of our generation, a really interesting mind. What, what's, what's your take on Jeff Bezos? Well, as I say in the introduction to this wonderful book, Invent and Wander, which is out next month from HBR Press, it's, he has these same characteristics of ever since he was a little kid growing up in, you know, in Miami, but also his grandfather's ranch in Texas. He was curious about everything. He loved, of course, space travel, but he loved business. He loved, you know, nature. And uh, he loved books and writing and philosophy. And so somebody who not only had a passion and a curiosity for everything, but that enthusiasm that's captured in his almost manic laugh, when I looked at the way he grew up, when I talked to him about his childhood and all the way through, it's you don't create the everything store unless you're interested in everything. And you don't, you don't, you're not able to tie business and arts and the humanities and literature to commerce, to technology, to engineering, unless you have that enthusiasm for everything. So I tried to capture that in the introduction to Invent and Wander. Sounds like a great book. I, I sort of think everyone should go out and pre-order a copy on Amazon right now. <laughs> I hope Amazon gives you a discount. <laughs> they don't give discounts. Um, so the last thing I want to talk to you about, and then we'll, um, I want to bring in Octavia and Josh, and, and that's leadership. Um, you know, some of your, the, the people you've studied are uh, effective uh, business and political leaders. You know, we're at a moment now that seems to call for extraordinary leadership. You know, people who can guide us, who can comfort us, who can feel the way forward and also feel our pain. Talk about, you know, what does it take to be a great leader today? And has that, has that changed in the past, you know, decades? Well, I don't think there's any one formula for great leadership. And I wrote about it for the Harvard Business Review once when I did the 10 lessons from Steve Jobs as a 
story that you and I worked on and ran in your magazine, which is you need certain leaders like Steve Jobs who are abrasive and aggressive, and they're just going to have a reality distortion field and barrel through things. But every now and then you need a great leader like a Tim Cook who knows how to consolidate things, get things done, and build great teams, as Steve Jobs also did. So I think that, you know, when I wrote about Benjamin Franklin, that's the greatest team ever, which is the founders of this nation. But you had to have passionate people like John and Sam Adams. You had to have a person of great rectitude like George Washington and brilliant people like Jefferson and Madison and also people who were the glue that would bring them together like Benjamin Franklin. So, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos has a particular style of leadership. I think each of us, when we lead, when I had to lead CNN or Time Magazine or Aspen, I figure out what, what do I like to do as a leader and then how do I create a team around me to become a great leader? But the traits we need now to get back to the point of your question is sometimes you need a certain type of traits for a particular time. Uh, just as you needed a Steve Jobs uh, at the birth of the personal computer revolution. And you listed the traits that I feel we need now is empathy, honor, this notion that uh, that you want to bring people together, that there's some unity, that we're one nation with one mission. And it's that especially comes from a trait that some leaders have and others don't. It was not Steve Jobs' greatest trait, which is deep empathy for the feelings of other people. Um, all right. So let me let me bring in Octavia and Josh to uh, to ask more questions of Walter. And I'll be peppering in questions from our audience as well. Again, if you want to pose a question to Walter, type it in the comments box. Uh, again, this is HPR now and uh, over to my co-hosts. So, Walter, I'm curious because you you're, you know, clearly uh, right about people with that intersection as you talk about art and science. And I don't necessarily think of Donald Trump that way, but yet he is this, uh, you know, figure who consumes our, our thoughts and our tweets all the time. Are you compelled at all to think about him as someone you might want to uh, uh, do a biography on? Or and I'm, and I'm curious how you even look at his traits in contrast or comparison to some of the people that you've talked about. No, I have no interest in, I'm sure there are other people who write biographies on Donald Trump. It's not something that interests me. And I think that Donald Trump was um, able to tap into a deep sense of resentment, uh, some anger, uh, and some, some sense that people had been frustrated by an elite, an establishment that had left them behind, that looked down upon them. And that was something that I think a lot of people, especially in the media and on the coast didn't quite feel I'm down in Louisiana. And when I drive around, you know, especially in the middle of America, I understand a sense of frustration and resentment. Uh, I think that was Donald Trump's uh, ability, which is to tap into anger and to stoke resentments. Uh, but that's not a leadership trait that I either admire or that I would ever want to write about. Mm -hmm. So, Walter, earlier this month, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Chapontier were announced as the winners of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Right. And Dr. Doudna is the subject of your next book, The Code Breaker. Yeah. What drove your desire to tell her story? Well, I think it was, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize Committee put it uh, best when they said that this is about the code of life. This is a type of science that will change epochs. Uh, when I wrote about Einstein, it was because the first half of the 20th century was a century of physics that came out of Einstein's papers. Whether it was relativity or quantum theory, what you end up with is everything from atom bombs to semiconducting materials to GPS to space travel, that sort of thing. Then the second half of the 20th century, I think, was a century in which innovation was driven uh, by digital uh, technology, and it comes with three great inventions in the early 1950s, which is the computer, the transistor or microchip, uh, and then the network. And when those three combine, you get a digital revolution. I think the first half of the 20th century will be a biotech revolution, 
based on what happened in 2000, which was the sequencing of the human genome, uh, but also based on what Dr. Doudna and Dr. Charpentier discovered, which is easy to use tools where we can not only read the DNA of our species and any other, but we can edit the DNA of our species. This became a lot more relevant when coronavirus hit because coronavirus is simply, you know, a viral infection and CRISPR, which is the gene editing tool that Jennifer Doudna and others helped develop, uh, is simply a way that bacteria fight off viruses. Bacteria do it by remembering some of the genetic code of viruses. And when the viruses attack again, they chop up that genetic code. In other words, it's an immune system that adapts to each new wave of virus, which is just what we need in this era where we've been hit by wave after wave of pandemics as if we lived in the Middle Ages. And so what I think we're seeing that COVID and coronavirus and all the viral pandemics and CRISPR are going to accelerate is the transition to the third great innovation re uh, revolution of our time, which will be the biotech revolution. I was very lucky to get on it with Jennifer Doudna, who's both a wonderful person, but um, to catch it right when she and Emmanuel Charpentier, who's the co-star of the book, uh, when the Nobel Prize was pretty exciting. I set my alarm clock. I knew the chemistry prize was coming out. And I thought it's too early. They usually wait 40 or 50 years. But I set my alarm for about 4.30 a.m., because I just wanted to be watching uh, when the Royal Swedish Academy did the announcement, just in case. And as soon as it happened, I called Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer. So it's a good last chapter in the book. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, just switching over to back to technological innovation for a minute, and especially, especially on the social media front, where we see so much innovation with people like Zuckerberg and others. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about balancing the need for that innovation against kind of the, the negative effects of people not always understanding how social media shapes public opinion. Well, I think the biggest thing that uh, happened uh, uh, in that field happened today. It probably got buried by tweets of the president, but the Justice Department and many states attorney general have filed an antitrust suit against Google. I think what happened is you have four great companies, you know, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Apple, and Google, and especially in the case of Google and Facebook, and to some extent Amazon, there's certain antitrust, well, definitely Amazon, antitrust issues. When it comes to Facebook, it's particularly important because Facebook is not only the dominant uh, social media platform, but once it was allowed to buy WhatsApp and buy um, uh, Instagram, it almost just uh, became a monopoly in some ways for certain aspect of social media. And why that's important is because the business model of Amazon, which is based only really on advertising, has a incentive to enrage people, to engage them, to bring them down rabbit holes, to get them more and more excited about their particular ideological passions. And so instead of doing what Zuckerberg and others thought they were doing at the beginning of Facebook, which is to connect us, it's ended up dividing us. And uh, I thought social media was great. I'm on Twitter, I sometimes use Facebook and Instagram. But I think about three or four years ago, I began to get the sense that social media was doing more harm than good, especially to our democracy. I definitely feel that now. And it would be great in my mind if we had lots of competing companies, uh, because I think a Facebook that's protected by Section 230, that gives it a lot of immunity for um, whatever people post on its platform, and then people post and repost things that are hateful, and then Facebook's own algorithm uh, not only publishes that, but amplifies that. I think hopefully in the next couple of years, we're going to get a Congress that in a bipartisan way can say, how do we take on the insidious effects of social media? Mm -hmm. So, Walter, in addition to being a best-selling biographer, you're a professor of history at Tulane. You know, as a result of this pandemic, parents, educators, students are pivoting fast. What are your thoughts on the challenges we face with the closure and tentative reopening of schools and campuses? I'm very much in favor of schools 
K through 12 schools and also college campuses trying to reopen. Down here in New Orleans, I've supported the mayor very strongly, who for months said, we're going to shut down bars, we're going to shut down casinos, we're going to shut every live music venue because we're going to keep in mind that our number one priority is making sure kids at least have some opportunity to get back to school. Because this divide in our society, which has you know, gotten worse over the past 20 years, is exacerbated by differences in education opportunities. And those differences have been heightened, uh, especially when people are trying to do distance learning. I think most of what you learn in school and even in college involves teamwork, collaboration, socializing, the social skills you get, being able to work together. So I think as a country, we should have focused on doing everything possible, including, you know, at Tulane, students are tested twice a week. There's special dorms for people uh, who have COVID. Uh, but figuring out everything we could possibly do to have in-person instruction when we could and shutting down things that, in our, my mind, aren't fully necessary, such as the bars of Bourbon Street. <laughs> So we have a lot of people watching and we have a lot of questions coming in. Again, if you just joined us, this is HBR Now. Uh, if you have questions for Walter Isaacson, type them into the comments box. So let's do a few of these. So this is from Clay from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's asking, and you've started to answer this with your what you were saying about social media, but there's more to say. The question is, with so much misinformation today, people are left not really knowing what or whom to believe. How do we turn this around? Adi and I grew up in the great time, Inc., in the 1980s and 1990s, when we were pretty much uh, trained not to try to be ideological and to report things and to check them. And it was uh, magazines like Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and networks and even uh, publications both on the left and the right, from the New Republic to the National Review, that set a certain standard so that we could have a diversity of opinion, but we shared a common set of facts. I think it's extraordinarily dangerous to try to use terms like fake news uh, to undermine the notion that good reporting and an objective common set of facts are necessary for a democracy. It's a very authoritarian trick. I mean, um, the phrase enemy of the people. I remember reading Henri Gibson's play by that name, uh, where those mantras of enemy of the people or fake news were done uh, by authoritarian governments in order to try to protect uh, what they thought was their own personal interests. So we have to get back to the institutions of our society, whether it's the Centers for Disease Control or uh, the various parts of the news media. The good thing about the news media today is it is more varied. Uh, there are you know, dozens of opinion magazines, really hundreds of them, but dozens of big ones uh, on the internet. There's you know, scores of everything from talk radio to blogosphere and Twitter feeds. So you can get a variety of opinion, but we still have to do, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan always admonished us, to say we have the right to our own opinion, but not the right to our own facts. Great. Here's another question. This is from Uyo Gose Obazua. I probably did not pronounce that correctly, from Edo, uh, Nigeria. He's a fan. He says he likes history. He likes learning from the world's great minds, past and present. The Albert Einstein book remains one of his favorites um, because he was the greatest thinker of the 20th century. So the question is, who will that be in the 21st century? Who will we look back and say the greatest thinker of the 21st century was? Yeah, well, fortunately, we're new in this century, and that's a really good question. I think we have to figure out, as we did, and Adi, you may remember this, when we picked a person of the century for the 20th century at Time Magazine, we ended up picking Einstein, but our thought process began with saying, what was the century going to be remembered for? And we knew it would be remembered for the triumph of democracy over Nazism and communism. And so that led us to people like Franklin Roosevelt. We knew it would also be known as a century where individuals got rights, and that led us to Martin Luther King and Gandhi as possibilities. But my belief is that the 20th century will be remembered most for its science, where we 
you know, not only went to the moon and then split the atom, uh, but all the great advances of science. And that led us to Einstein. I suspect that the 21st century will be a also be a century of technology, science and business, not of politicians. Politicians have receded in their influence. I just uh, talked to Kara Swisher uh, yesterday and I said, who's more important? The people who run the tech con companies or the people who run Congress? And she said, it's not even close. The people, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's more powerful than, you know, Chuck Schumer or Mitch McConnell even. Uh, so I think we're going to see, and to me, as I said, it's going to be a life sciences century. So people who are able to harness the technologies of the life sciences and connect it to our moral understanding, to our humanities, those will be the people that will dominate the 21st century. And I'm hoping a grand figure will come along who will represent that. All right, let me, let me do one more question from the audience. This is from Paul Langrop from Richmond, Texas. The question is, all right, he, he talks about Franklin. He says, we're in the middle of a mudslinging presidential election rather similar to 1800. Question is, is there still room for a statesman like Benjamin Franklin with his use of, use of soft Socratic inquiries to rise to national status and influence the people? I think there's not only a place for it, I think there's a hunger for it. And I you know, hope it's manifest this year, where I hope people are voting up and down the ticket for the people who are most able to unite us and be rational. Benjamin Franklin felt that compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. And I think we're seeing that now, even when the Congress tries to figure out how to handle the pandemic or the economy, People unwilling to make the compromises are not willing to make great democracies. When Benjamin Franklin, his greatest speech in my mind came at the end of the Constitutional Convention. And it was a speech partly about humility. He was twice as old as the other people in that room on average. And he said, the older I get, something very strange happens to me. I realize I've been wrong at times. And other people who argued with me turned out to be right. And he said, look to the persons next to you at this convention and imagine that years from now, you'll realize that they may turn out to be right and you were wrong. That should give you a bit of humility. Uh, and he said, when we were young tradesmen, uh, in Philadelphia, and you had a joint of wood that didn't hold together, you'd take a little from one side and a little from the other until it would hold together for centuries. And so, too, we here at this convention must do that. And to me, that's a really three-pronged set of ideas that weave together, which is humility, which is at the core of democracy. Humility to realize that even if you strongly hold your beliefs, that the person next to you may turn out to be right. And even if they aren't right, they have an equal right to their opinions. So that humility, that willingness to compromise, and that sense, as Franklin put on our currency, e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one. We should keep those things in mind as we try to write the gyroscope of American democracy. So last question, would you hazard a prediction as to what is going to happen on November 3rd? Not really. Last time around, I went up against all of my friends because I thought that Donald Trump would win. I had driven across the country with my wife, Kathy, uh, that summer of what 2016. And among the things I felt was the resentment at the Aspen Institute, Time Inc., Davos, HBR. Uh, elite uh, for leaving people behind. I also saw Trump sign, Trump sign, Trump sign all along. And I talked to my smart friends who covered politics. They said, oh, don't count yard signs. We count Facebook likes. And I said, yeah, but you talk to people in the dime. He said, oh, but we know how to do polling. You don't want to talk to people. Well, I think we ought to get back to looking at the lawn signs and talking to the people and get a better feel for it. I do feel it's turned around a bit, even down here in Louisiana, where you see a lot of you know big Trump flags. Suddenly, I'm seeing Biden, Biden, Biden signs and flags, which actually surprises me some because he's not a person who would engender passion, which, as I say, I don't think we need more passion at the moment in our politics. So uh, I'm feeling that uh, the more conventional wisdom that Biden is 
leading on this probably feels right to me. But as um, I think it was uh, Harold Wilson said, a week is a long time in politics and we've got two weeks. Yeah. All right. That's fantastic. I think we're out of time, but I want to thank you. Thank Walter Isaacson for a great conversation. I want to thank our sponsor, Accenture, for its support. We will be back next week at 12 noon Eastern time for another episode of HBR Now. Our guest will be Nubar Afayan, the co-founder and chairman of Moderna, which is one of the companies leading the hunt for a COVID uh, vaccine. So thank you all for tuning in.